Hello everybody and welcome back to The Science Of, the show where I take a look at the science behind your favourite game shows and more. Today we're diving deep into that most iconic group of giant movie monsters from the silver screen. That's right, I am of course talking about Godzilla and friends. This giant prehistoric reptile was brought to life by Akira Watanabe and Taizo Toshimitsu, with their iconic design being represented on screen by actor Nakajima Haru, wearing a monster suit weighing an astounding 90 kilograms. In the original movie, Godzilla was shown as a 50 meter tall monstrosity, coming out of the ocean to unleash his atomic breath and destructive power across the city of Tokyo. And whilst his size may have changed a lot over the years, Godzilla's always been a force for destruction, taking on cities throughout time. But as is the case with all city attacking monsters, people don't tend to like their homes being destroyed. But how do you deal with a problem like Godzilla? Well in most cases you would normally send in some special forces to attempt to blow him up. But that normally doesn't go so well. Instead, a pretty clever method is introduced to take down a rampaging Godzilla. Meet the Oxygen Destroyer. This little device, as its name might suggest, is a device that's able to remove all oxygen atoms within a certain radius, causing all members of the animal kingdom to pass away from oxygen deprivation. But Godzilla's a pretty big boy, 50 meters of muscle, atomic breath and roaring potential. Would you even need to use an oxygen destroyer to take down this walking dinosaur? Let's dive into the science of Godzilla to find out. Now, considering that Godzilla is 50 meters tall in his first iteration, he's going to have some lungs similar to the size of hot air balloons, bringing in oxygen and throwing out carbon dioxide to give him the energy he needs to stomp his way across Tokyo. Consider the blue whale. These aquatic giants can grow up to 33 meters in length, and on average, they have been found to have lungs with a total capacity of 5,000 liters of air. Let's scale that up to our 50 meter Godzilla. Their lungs would need to be significantly larger to take in enough oxygen in order to move as you'd expect, what with jump kicks and all. But Godzilla doesn't spend all of their time above ground, no, no, no. They spend a lot of time underwater in some sort of hibernative state. How would that be possible? Because Godzilla is going to need that oxygen from somewhere, unless he has the world record for the longest held breath. Well fortunately Godzilla's design does provide an explanation as to how they could survive underwater for so long, with flaps of skin surrounding Godzilla's neck, which suggests that Godzilla has some kind of gills on him to help him survive underwater. Now gills are pretty great mechanically speaking, formed of branches of feathery tissue that when underwater flow and expand to create quite a large surface area. This surface area is absolutely covered in blood vessels that oxygen and carbon dioxide can exchange across. These blood vessels need to maintain a consistent oxygen gradient and as such the gills oxygen supply will flow counter to the flow of water over the gills. But these gills are absolutely pointless on land, with the water missing they they can't balloon out and will instead just collapse. And this is where Godzilla's lungs would take over. Godzilla is a giant city destroying dinosaur, and like all giant monsters, he will be needing a lot of energy in order to be breaking down those buildings, and that energy requires oxygen. So he had better be filling his lungs as full of that sweet sweet oxygen as possible. But again, Godzilla's a dinosaur, not your bog standard mammal, and surely that's going to make a difference to the way they take in oxygen and throw out CO2 into the world. We naturally don't have any fossil records of what dinosaur lungs looked like, because fossil records are heavily biased towards the preservation of hard parts of animals like teeth, bones and shells. So to get an idea as to how these Godzilla could breathe, we would have to turn to their nearest living ancestor, birds. The internal structure of lungs in birds have a single primary air chamber called the bronchus, with multiple secondary bronchi all interconnected by a network of tubes called the parabronchi. This interlaced network of tubes is where most gas exchange occurs. During both inhalation and exhalation, air flows towards the rear of the bronchi on the stomach side of the body and forward in the bronchi on the animal's back. This unidirectional flow of gas was once thought to only be characteristic to birds, but it's also been found in crocodiles and some other species of reptile. From here, it's a simple hop, skip and a jump to assuming that dinosaurs had the same method of gas exchange. But unfortunately, a million years of evolution can cause some pretty significant changes. Birds are unique among most air breathing vertebrates because their lungs are rigid. They don't expand or contract at all, being entirely utilised for gas exchange and ventilation is achieved through a system of air sacs that expand and contract in line with the movements of the bird's ribs and sternum, causing airflow in and out of the lungs. 
but how do we know that prehistoric monsters like Godzilla are in any way related to our feathery friends? Well, when we take a look at the fossilized bones of meat-eating dinosaurs like the T-Rex, we find evidence of pneumatic foramina, holes in the bones that connect to air-filled chambers. These are associated with the presence of air sacs and is one of the key pieces of evidence linking birds to their monstrous ancestors. So most likely, Godzilla would utilize partition lungs, split into a gas exchanging lung with ventilatory air sacs in front and behind. The lungs were most likely rigid, similar to birds. And these respiratory systems would help explain the fairly high level of activity and high metabolic rates we see in Godzilla, over typical reptiles' cold-blooded lifestyle. But it's been a while since I've shown any of that classic Godzilla destruction, so it's time for my favorite part of the show. Did you know? Godzilla's most iconic attack, their city destroying atomic breath, is caused by a high concentration of radioactive elements which Godzilla has learned to utilize to produce energy internally in self-fueled bioreactors. This atomic power is said to have an energy yield of 3.15 times 10 to the 14 joules, 1000 times more powerful than the energy released in a nuclear fission reaction of a single uranium nucleus. And that's the equivalent to over 75,000 tons of TNT. No wonder he's able to tear down a city block in a single breath. But Godzilla wouldn't make a very good king of the monsters if he had only ever destroyed some pesky buildings. In order for Godzilla to be considered king of the monsters, he had to have fought quite a few in his time. Godzilla has fought a slew of the most iconic monsters Japan has to offer, ranging from King Ghidorah to King Caesar. But to me, the most interesting massive monster is Mothra, because Mothra, unlike most other iconic movie monsters, is a giant insect instead of a reptile. Now, when it comes to insects, we're not looking at beings with lungs like your giant average movie monster. We're dealing with what is known as the tracheal system of gas exchange. In insects, respiration is independent of its circulatory system, and therefore blood isn't a factor in oxygen transport. Instead, insects have a dedicated network of small tubes that carry oxygen throughout the entire body carrying oxygen directly to the cells, making it the most direct and efficient respiratory system in the animal kingdom. All along the insect's body, they have small openings called spiracles. These openings connect to a tight network of tubes that allow oxygen to pass into the body, regulating the diffusion of carbon dioxide and water vapor. And this isn't limited to Mothra. Another classic Godzilla insectoid, Megalon, would have a very similar series of tubes. Megalon is a giant beetle cockroach-like creature, and unfortunately for their drilly hands, a study came out in 2007 that took aim at the idea of giant beetles. This study used x-ray images to compare the tracheal dimensions of different species of beetles, ranging in size from 3mm to as large as 3.5cm. Their study found that the larger a beetle became, the greater proportion of their bodies would have to be taken up with these tracheal networks. This is because the tracheal system is not only becoming longer to reach longer limbs, but also increasing in diameter to allow more air in to handle the insect's new oxygen demands. And this exponential growth reaches a critical point at the point where the beetle's legs and body meet, meaning that you can't get a beetle larger than the titanic longhorn beetle found in South Africa, which grows up to 17 centimeters in length. But the more prehistoric insect savvy amongst you might be shining from the rooftops. What about prehistoric dragonfly? They were about half a meter long and were able to get around just fine. And that is very true. Meet Meganora. This species of extinct insect lived approximately 300 million years ago, in the late Carboniferous period. Fossil records show that just like modern beetles and moths, Meganora utilize oxygen diffusion throughout the insect's body via tracheal breathing systems. So why don't we have giant dragonflies flying all over the place? Well, it's been suggested that Maganora was only able to fly around the Earth because the atmosphere in the Carboniferous period contained a much greater concentration of oxygen than the current 20%, somewhere in the region of 35% oxygen. Over the course of millions of years, the climate cooled down and land plants died off causing oxygen levels to fall as low as 12% by the beginning of the Triassic period, which would have been way too low for these giant dragonflies to be gliding around. 
So there we go. Screw the oxygen annihilation device and the military. It looks like the Earth's doing a good job getting rid of these monsters by itself. The moment that a monster like Mothra wakes up and takes flight, it's going to find out that there's simply not enough oxygen in the atmosphere to support its massive wings. And Godzilla's not going to fare any better. His days of wrestling dragons and robots are very limited. If you want to see me talk about some more of the science behind some classic movie monsters, then make sure to leave a comment down below telling me what your favourite movie monster is. The best comments will appear at the end of the next video. Or, if you want to see me talk about something else that's giant, though not necessarily a monster, click the link here to take a look at the signs behind a giant snowman from Banjo-Kazooie's Freeze Easy Peaks. Or alternatively, if you want to see me take a look at the signs behind another dinosaur, then take a look at the video here to see why Yoshi actually might be less of a dinosaur and more of a frog. Either way, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel in order to see more of the signs behind your favourite game shows and more.